Welcome to Building a Customer API, where we interview an engineer from a high profile company that's recently felt the pain of building a public customer or partner API. I'm your host, Josh Twist. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Zuplo. Zuplo is API management designed for developers that doesn't require weeks of engineering resources, gives you better control of your API experience and the experience of the developers that use it, and uses GitOps instead of ClickOps. Today, I'm joined by Arsham Fagihi of OnCall Health. Josh, happy to be here. So yeah, I'm, I'm Arsham. I, I, um, I've been an engineer my whole life, as long as I can remember, really. <laughs> um, and um, I, you know, I've studied a pretty broad range of different technologies. Um, I've done DevOps, I've done front end, I've done back end, I've done mobile. Uh, over the years, I've, I've been at several different startups, and uh, most recently, I've been leading the engineering team here at OnCall Health, which is a uh, SaaS startup that enables healthcare organizations to bring their practices into the digital world. Awesome. Tell us, tell us a little bit more about that. What does it mean to help a healthcare practice bring, you know, get into the digital world? What does that look like? Like, give us some examples. Yeah, I, you know, I, I love Shopify as an example because it's it's kind of a business in a box, right? Uh, Shopify helped a lot of retail stores bring their business online. Uh, there's a lot of things that went into that, like processing payments, dealing with shipping and logistics, setting up the e-com site. We're very similar, uh, but in the healthcare world, which has its own set of challenges. Healthcare is uh, a very tri tricky to navigate and slow moving world, very similar to finance. There's a lot of regulatory requirements. There's a lot of resistance to change. Um, and, and so, you know, when you think about the traditional healthcare setting, like going into a doctor's office, sitting in a waiting room, waiting for your name to be called, going and talking for five, 10 minutes um, and dealing with all the paperwork, uh, there's a lot of inefficiencies that exist in, in that world. And um, there's several fields of healthcare. We specifically focus on behavioral health and mental health that benefit a lot from bear, uh, tearing down the walls and the barriers for people to, to, get, uh, to get care. And digital um, literacy with healthcare providers helps a lot with uh, efficiency and operational efficiency and helping those businesses provide more care to more people. Awesome. Uh, that sounds great. Well, uh, and, you know, such an important area to work in and like see improvements. What's an example of an efficiency improvement, like a, a really simple one? Where, you know, how, how are you helping streamline a, a process in, in that space? Yeah, I, I think one, a very simple one is um, reminders. Uh, one of the biggest expenses to healthcare organizations is no-shows. People who make appointments uh, don't mm -hmm. show up. Uh, it's hard to bill insurance when the person didn't actually receive care. So um, a lot of offices traditionally had staff that would go through a list and make sure to call people a day or two before their appointment, remind them of where they're going to go uh, and, and how to get there and what time their appointment is. Uh, these are, as engineers, we, we think of these as very simple things to automate, right? And there's a whole host of these, these types of operations that, that can be automated. Uh, and, um, and so we, we kind of take that whole process, the end to end of providing care to a patient, which starts from intaking the patient, uh, getting their details, having them fill out paperwork. Um, and then there's of course the added or different complexities of, of the virtual world, like setting up your, your uh, device, your phone, your microphone, camera, whatever else it might be. Uh, we help you, we help the patients get that set up in an automated way and take all that load off the providers. Okay, that's awesome. That's something that um, became especially important during the pandemic, right? When uh, people exactly. were doing uh, remote health uh, so frequently. Sound, uh, sounds great. Sounds like a really interesting business. Um, I could dig into those details more, but obviously we're here to talk about APIs as kind of our, our mainstay. Um, so what does the API environment look like at On Health? What types of APIs do you have? Who are the clients of them? In, you know, internal, external, both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, maybe I can give a bit of background context on APIs in general in the healthcare space. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, you know, there's a large fragmentation of software and services um, that is used in healthcare. Um, so there's a lot of back ends and front ends that go into serving patients and, and getting them care. There's something called EMRs, which is ele electronic medical record systems, uh, or EHRs, electronic health record systems out there uh, that healthcare organizations will use to keep track of patients, take notes, a whole host of things. And um, they, they're kind of like the central database, but there's so many of them out there. And for them uh, to work cohesively with all the other tools and software that the organization might be using, uh, obviously you need a good deal of interoperability out there. And historically, these, these services have been very closed off uh, and you know, weren't really willing to open up their data to, uh, to be integrated with. And what happened a few years ago in 2016 was the US passed something called the Cures Act, which prohibits um, healthcare providers and healthcare vendors from what they call information blocking, meaning it's actually, if you, if you want to be a certified healthcare software in the US, you are required to open up your data for integration. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're not covered by that law, but it's actually opened up the world uh, of healthcare to kind of realize how important interoperability is and in, in the types of um, operational efficiencies and, and time savings you can get by having uh, you know, APIs that are open and usable and, and integrations that you can build. And so what we've done is our service has opened uh, an external API as well. We did this fairly early on uh, that lets you integrate on call with your EMRs or any other service that you might be using. So you want to send out a patient reminder or send out an appointment, schedule an appointment, um, send out forms or see the responses that a patient filled out in their forms, all of that, anything ideally that a user is able to do in the system, we want uh, available through the API. Wow, that's awesome. Actually, I had no idea about that. Um, the change you mentioned that's kind of driving APIs to be more open. It almost seems, seems um, a little unusual. Like when I think about the healthcare industry, I think about regulation impeding progress in some cases, you know, it being a, a, it could advance faster without as much regulation. Obviously, I understand why the regulation is in place. That sounds like a great move, actually, that's, uh, that's driving that, that change and then that, that sort of interoperability. Um, cool. So I think that's great context, actually, for the environment you work in. So tell me more about the, the APIs at, at on-call health, you know, the different types you have, um, what that, what that landscape looks like. Yeah, we, we've tried to cover uh, the entire spectrum of patient care. So when you think about the life cycle of a patient receiving care, and again, we, we mainly focus on behavioral health, mental health, therapy, drug addictions, things like that. So it's a little bit different than what you might expect at a, at a hospital, but very similar mm -hmm. type of thinking. Um, there's there's a, a whole process um, before the patient receives care and after the patient receives care. And some of it is visible um, and forward facing, some of it is entirely back end. And, and so, you know, from end to end, a patient might come and want to book on your calendar. So you need to provide what times you're available with. So that's a great point of integration is, is to provide your availability uh, to, to your services. Um, and then the patient might book some time, fill out some forms, and uh, you may want to react to the way that the patient filled out a form. If they're indicating certain behaviors, you may want to react more quickly uh, in those cases. And so that information flowing to you is, is really important because you might want to build some custom logic for yourself, right? And so forms that you've built in the system that the patient has filled out can, uh, you know, all that data that, that you've asked and the answers that come along with them are available to be sent to the, to the healthcare system as a webhook. Hmm. Um, and, and uh, you know, and then in, in return, the systems sometimes may book an appointment 
uh, with the patient at a certain time. Um, and uh, from the appointment onwards, you know, after the appointment, there may be a follow up. So you can you can uh, do scheduling, you can do historic lookups of appointments, you can look at the notes that the provider took, do analysis on those. Um, and then there's there's the, uh, you know, aftercare. So especially in, in spaces like addiction therapy, you may want to check in with your patients that, you know, graduated or, or left the program uh, periodically just to make sure they're doing okay. And so you may want to query your roster of patients to see who hasn't uh, been in a program in more than six months or whatever. Um, so we've made it fairly open and, uh, and been able to make it queryable with, with a lot of different parameters so that you can build to the workflow that you work with. And we've mm -hmm. learned in healthcare, there is no standard workflow. Every organization kind of has their own workflow. And so flexibility has been very important for us. And so, so we'll get into some technical details in a moment, but trying to understand the, the actors here around these APIs then. So you, you have OnCall Health has an API by the sound of things. You do webhooks and then you integrate with other products that also have an API and have webhooks. It sounds like it's sort of a symmetrical, um, a, a symmetrical system. Um, who, so the, the people consuming the API are typically developers at, you know, um, other products in the healthcare market. It's the people who work, you know, engineering team that works for the, 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 the provider, I think was the term you used. Mm. All of those, are there other actors I'm missing? Yeah, uh, in most cases with larger healthcare organizations, they will have their own development teams and resources that can build these types of integrations. Uh, for small organizations, they may contract out or mm -hmm. uh, use some sort of middleware that they're using. And that service may be the, uh, the primary consumer, but th those are, you kind of captured it. Th those are the main categories, yeah. Got it, got it. Okay, so let's talk about some of the, the tech in play then. So these APIs, I'm gonna guess they're, they're all HTTP APIs or have you got some other kind of wacky older stuff you deal with as well? <laughs> uh, in, in healthcare, there's, um, there's something called HL7 Fire, which is a healthcare standard. Um, we we don't use that. We use we just use REST on HTTP. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So it's REST and you, uh, anything along the lines of like GraphQL or your your pure REST or REST-ish based. We are we are pure REST. Uh, we are pure REST, and uh, that that's that's to keep it accessible to to make sure that um, you know we we are able to reach the broadest audience as possible. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'd love to pick up and talk about that in a bit about as well, about how you think about accessibility. I think like, I'd like to get into talking about sure. what makes a, <laughs> a great API and, you know, how you prioritize uh, designing the API. Let's get there in a second though. So let's talk more about the, these APIs. So you, the, the HTTP, the REST, um, what do you typically do for authentication, especially in such a regulated space? Yeah, obviously security and healthcare is is very important, um, but we get away with just using uh, API keys. Oh, and um, I mean, we're, we're pretty lucky in that all of our use cases are really just server to server. Uh, our, our APIs, they're never gonna be used from a customer's front end or anything like that. Um, they're never, at least not, not so far, they don't need to be um, tokened out with specific scopes. So things like, OAuth type uh, authentication flows are a little bit overkill, and, and we yeah. we were able to get away with a very simple um, API key system, which again helps a lot with accessibility. Interesting. Is that so? You say get away with it. It sounds like there's a trade off there that it that it saved you something. So it may you think it makes using the API easier. Uh, was it easier to develop as well than yeah. using OAuth? You think or? Uh, you know, I, th I think it's it's easier we've to, to implement at least with the system that we had. We're we're a Django um, Python Django backend, okay. and uh, we use a library called Django REST framework, which which makes the API key um, authentication system very very simple and trivial to implement. And, and so that was the path of least resistance for us. Um, whether that turns out to be a good long term decision is gonna is, is is going to be seen, but um, that was 
the quickest and easiest way to get it out. And so far, knock on wood, it's been all good. Awesome. Um, I'd love to dive into the tech a little bit and then we'll, then we'll talk about the accessibility. So, so you actually mentioned, you know, your Django, um, Python, where, where do you run most of the stuff? Is it on AWS or GCP or private data centers? Yeah, we're, we're on uh, EC2 instances on AWS, uh, moving towards dockerizing and containerizing those, but right now we are on AWS, yeah. Got it, got it. And do you use any kind of gateway products like AWS API Gateway that, that helps you with your APIs? No, we don't. We, we actually uh, use Django and Django REST framework to build out the... A lot of what you would traditionally find in, in, in a gateway product, um, we've, we've built it in there. Awesome. And what about other things then? So documentation, you know, you, you, mm. you, you clearly um, have a lot of empathy for the developers that use your product. You know, you, you keep mentioning accessibility and I, I assume that's the, the, the user you're thinking of in, the, in this case. Um, what do you do for documentation? How do you help people learn your API? Documentation is just as important, if not more important than the implementation, right? And mm. a, an API that's poorly documented or not usable, what's the point? And, and so we put a lot of thought in, into the way we wrote our documentation. We're using a tool called readme yep. uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to publish the documentation. Um, early on, we looked at tools that would uh, just automatically generate open API specs and push them mm -hmm. out to README. Uh, we didn't find it to be sufficient really. Um, and even with the, you know, the skeletal framework that an open, open API spec was giving us, we found ourselves massaging it quite a bit, adding mm -hmm. more context, um, adding notes about different scenarios and, and so it didn't really pan out to be as useful as we would have hoped uh, and, and so at that point we kind of just might as well um write it by hand and and have full curation of what's being published so you you are you generating in the first instance were you generating the open api spec from this Jan i'm not familiar with the django rest framework i'm afraid so a total noob to that was that generating the open api from you from type definitions or something Exactly. Yeah. So with Django REST framework, you can actually define uh, your routes as classes and mm -hmm. uh, define the parameters there. And it was generating it from that. Um, yeah. And then you imported that into README, started to massage perhaps the open API doc, massage, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of changes you can make on README, but you still weren't happy with that outcome. And so just decided to kind of file, file new project on README and just write everything from scratch. That's exactly it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And do you get feedback from your, from developers that use your product? Yeah. Um, I, I've sat on quite a few sales calls and prospect calls. We are we are a B two B business, so um, I get the um, it's we're lucky because we get to be close with our consumers. Hmm. And uh, I know that APIs are not flashy. They're not very <laughs> visual. It's hard to demo an API. Uh, but I often notice a change in tone when we when we pull up our API documentation uh, on mm. a call and show, you know, hey, look at everything we can do and how well it's documented and um, and you know how in depth that we we can go with with your system and and that that seems to be a really important component when we're talking to enterprise customers. Oh, wow. So essentially these are sales calls, I think you mentioned, and yeah. you're pulling up developer documentation on a sales call for a healthcare product. And you're saying that gives you an edge and might be helping you close deals. Oh, absolutely. Especially in, in healthcare where, like I was mentioning earlier, interoperability is really, really important. Mm. Having these different fragmented systems be able to talk to each other is 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 an absolute game changer and in many cases it's a deal breaker if it can't and um and us having this open api from early on in the business was was really important that's you know and i i go back to a couple of things you mentioned earlier that um some of the bigger providers might have sort of engine, engineering teams or smallish engineering teams and some of the smaller providers are outsourcing this work to you know, a consultancy or some sort of contractors. I'm guessing if they're more efficient, 
at using these APIs to do the integration. That's like re immediate cost savings and allows the in-house engineering team to work on other things. That's why this is attractive to them. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're talking to people who are business decision makers, right? They don't care if you're using ISO 8601 for your date format. They care how, <laughs> how much money is going to cost them to integrate with your system. That's their bottom line. And, and it's important it's important to keep that in mind as a developer uh, that, you know, at the end of the day, if you're building a, a monetized business, you, you need to keep your customer in mind as well. That's awesome. Okay. That's a great, uh, great story. I love that. Um, um, so, you know, you've talked quite a bit about accessibility and trying to make uh, this a, a compelling part of your product. What is your, what is your little playbook now on, on like writing a great accessible API? Like what makes a great API? What makes a great API? I mean, we, I think we, we all, we can all think of an API that we really like. Um, and um, the way, the way I think of it is, is that, you know, the I in API, it stands for interface, right? It is at the end of the day, at, at the end of the day, it is just another interface, just like a user interface that we might think about. And it's not visual, but I think there's a lot of parallels to be drawn in how we think about UIs and how we think about APIs. Um, and as developers, you know, when we're talking about UIs, we, we probably think a lot about the decisions that we're making with the UI, like uh, what the impact of putting a button here is, the font size. We can understand how it's going to affect the end user and we give it a lot of thought. Um, I know in a lot of cases, we may not give the same level of depth of thought when we're designing APIs, especially early on. Um, but I think that that's a mistake because there's a lot of uh, learnings that that could be had from mm. the principles of good UI design and good interface design in general uh, that, that could be ported over. And, and maybe it's just because you don't have a designer breathing down your neck with looking for per pixel perfection. <laughs> but um, but I, I think that that's how I think of it is, is just looking at it as an interface. Uh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's talk about some other things then. Like, uh, so we've talked about keys, you know, you picked API keys because you think they're easier for people to use. They're plenty secure. Um, even in a regulated field like healthcare, I think that's really interesting. Um, you talked about docs and how important you think documentation is. You picked rest over other options because, you know, it's easier for people to learn. I, I think, um, we heard that in our last chat from, um, from someone that actually went the GraphQL path. They, they, Utsav was um, another interview we did, and uh, they used GraphQL, but noted that there was a learning curve. Um, you know, it took a few months for people to kind of get on top of it. How do you think about versioning and compatibility of a of an API in this space? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll draw this back to the to the UI <laughs> example I was just talking about. It, it is one of the principles of good design is is to keep it familiar. Um, I think we've all seen uh, maybe a big social media site go through a, a massive redesign. And even if that redesign was objectively and empirically better, uh, you will always see an uproar from people. Mm. And that's just because you've introduced this unexpected cognitive load on them to relearn the interface. Uh, and and so we, we, we go to a great lengths to make sure that any changes we're making to our API remains backwards compatible and that we don't lock ourselves in the corner uh, in the future. And um, obviously that's not always gonna be avoidable, um, but the way I think of it is, is versioning should kind of be almost the last resort and, and mm. we should be thinking about keeping it backwards compatible to minimize uh, the disruption to the people who are already consuming it. Um, and, and if you think about it, like if you're versioning, either you're going to be maintaining all of your versions with different patches, upgrades, or whatever, which is going to be a headache to you, mm. or you're going to deprecate the older versions, which is going to be a headache to your customers, which is going to be a headache to you. So that's my thinking. Uh, avoid versioning whenever possible. And so, go so the back. Yeah. Uh, to date, have you had to do any versioning? Have you, have you, have you, is there, I, I mean, people are often curious in the actual approach people take as well. So, you know, are you in the camp of like URL based versioning or header based versioning? Do you, do you not do that at all in the current API? 
we're on we're, we're still on version one um and we we haven't versioned at all yet um yeah, I'm, I'm in the i'm in the url versioning camp <laughs> just for <laughs> so it's uh your you i haven't actually seen your your api it's it's slash v1 slash something 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 is the approach Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, we're, we're kind of like at the V1, but uh, hopefully we'll stay there as long as we can. Yeah, it's always up with Stripe. They're still on V1, even though they've done three versions. Um, so so um, uh, tell me more. Why, why are you in the URL versioning camp? Any particular strong opinions there? I, I wouldn't say I have a strong opinion. I, I do think uh, it is more explicit and a, a little easier to to see what version you're actually hitting um, yeah. rather than the header. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say I have, I have a strong opinion on that one. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so I'd like to talk about protection. Have you had any incidents of um, hackers or customers hitting your API really hard and causing you headaches or problems? We have had developers accidentally doing that yeah if, mm -hmm. if they write a bad loop um that's happened but we do have rate limiting in place uh, to protect against um uh, th those types of <laughs> errors and issues that could come up and uh, nice um, and what's the how do you approach that did you write it yourself or are you using a library or some other service uh, rate limiting. I mean, this this is where an API gateway would have would have been really helpful. But we we use Django REST framework has a built in rate limiting service, and you can actually write custom policies in there, mm. which is nice because you can kind of tie in application logic to your rate limiting. Uh, if if you have a particular user that needs a different rate limit, um, it's it's super easy to configure it in that way. Uh, or if you have different packages or any any application level logic you want might want to put in, but yeah, we we use Django REST frameworks built in rate limiting. Nice, nice, awesome. Um, so in in terms of other topics, I'm curious: uh, are there any other interesting implications of working in healthcare uh, with respect to building APIs and 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 the regulation there? Anything? Um, do you think it's gotten easier over time now, today versus 10 years ago to build in the healthcare space? I think it got, I, I think we, we saw the most amount of change over the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, mm. There was, obviously, as everyone scrambled to find digital solutions, along comes with that, the need for digital interoperability. Um, some of the, and, and, and like some of the interesting challenges within healthcare specifically. Um, one, of, one of them is, is data residency, which is an interesting one. Uh, hmm. if, you're, if you're a patient, uh, your, your data needs to stay uh, in, in the jurisdiction that you're in, uh, often the same country that you're in. Um, and so we, we actually have to route your data to an AWS data center that's as close to you as possible geographically. Uh, and, and so we, we've actually deployed multiple instances of, of the app and, uh, and data is routed to the correct data center and it stays there. It can't be stored at rest in a different geographical uh, jurisdiction. Got it. Interesting. And so it's, it's really about the storage at rest, like when it's written to disk somewhere and persisting versus how it might be. I'm, I'm guessing if I'm a customer of yours, I could still access my data if I'm on a vacation in Europe or something but that data has to be written to a disk that resides on US sovereign soil. Yeah, exactly. It, it's hard to route data in, without <laughs> ensuring that it doesn't leave the borders. So it, in transit, it can leave, but at rest, it has to stay. Interesting. Okay. Last, last couple of topics for you. Um, really, it's about, about the build out. So, so, you know, there's obviously a lot of what people traditionally call business logic in your product that's very domain specific. But we've talked today about a lot of cross cutting concerns that probably apply to most APIs, like API keys, um, generating documentation or writing documentation, um, rate limiting using the library that you mentioned. Um, tell me a little bit more about the API key solution you're using in, in Django REST framework. That I assume that includes the, the, the element that runs in the HTTP pipeline that actually checks that the key is valid and sends back a 401 if it's, if it's not. Is that right? Yeah, we, we've actually written middleware uh, 
to, to handle the authentication for our, our API. So the, the middleware is what's actually ensuring that you, you have the right key. Now, the, the key generation is, is something that we built in-house. We're, ah, okay. we're just generating a UUID. Uh, yeah. This is something that I would love to move on to a, another service because, um, you know, who wants to handle key generation and, and, and all that. Uh, but part of it is that every time that we we're dealing with uh, a large enterprise customer, we have to go through a whole process mm. where we're disclosing all of the different services that we're touching. And so just to minimize that surface area, will, a lot of the times in healthcare, it's easier to keep it in-house wherever possible. But yeah, the API key generation is, is one that I feel like is an easy candidate to, to outsource to a different got service. It. So you've got your own data storage, you store these keys encrypted or hashed or something, yeah. and you provide some sort of management experience for your developers to access those keys and roll them and right. manage them, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, with the the security concerns, I think as long as you're giving them the ability to revoke or rotate keys, yeah, um, I think you're 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 golden. And and uh, monitoring uh, the usage of the keys is is also important. So when was the last time it was used? What's it doing? Um, and uh, if you're able to to monitor your API uh, for unusual usage patterns, I, I think. You know that that's a great way to to keep um, to keep security concerns at bay. Interesting, yeah. And what are you doing for analytics and monitoring? So, uh, did you build a bunch of in-house reports and a data lake, or using a tool? We're using Datadog uh, to okay. to monitor um, abnormal patterns. Um, so, a lot of again, not something we want to build in-house, <laughs> not yet. Uh, but Datadog works works great for that. So, so for all of these pieces that you put together yourself, how long do you think you spent engineering that just roughly, you know, in terms of weeks, or months, whatever the right unit is? To, to get kind of an MVP of, of this API out was a bit, of, probably a bit under two months um, in, in total. And uh, this is with a very small team at the time. I think we were two or three people, no mm -hmm. more than that. Uh, but yeah, under two months, uh, quick to bootstrap. And um, I, I actually think writing good documentation took longer than, than actually implementing it. Um, but yeah, not, not too bad. Awesome. Well, that's, uh, that's, I think it's been a great discussion. Um, you know, some of the takeaways for me, uh, my favorite takeaway from this was how you folks see um, APIs as a differentiator and quality API experience as like an actual business differentiator that people might choose your product um, over a rival product. And obviously given, given what we do at Zuplo, we're big fans of people who care about developer experience on both ends, like the developer building the API, but perhaps even more importantly, the developer consuming the API. So some great takeaways there and a lot of great learnings. Thanks Arsham for hanging out and, and chatting. Anything you wanna share at the end of the, the podcast? No, it's a great time. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I love Zuplo. Took a look at your docs and um, best of luck to you. Yeah, thanks. Cool. I hope we'll, we'll, we'll do a catch up one at some point and see what's changed when you're mega successful in a year's time or even mm -hmm. more mega successful, I should say, in a year's time. For sure. Cool. We made Zuplo because we didn't feel that the API management and API gateway products in the market were really designed for the people that use them. Um, I founded Azure API Management. Uh, I worked at Stripe, I worked at Facebook and touched APIs um, uh, all of my career. And I felt that gateways and API management platforms were really designed for decision makers at the top of organizations. They weren't designed for the developers that use the gateway or for the developers that consume the API. And so that's what we're trying to do different with Zuplo. We want to make a great experience for both the people developing the API, save them time, get them quicker to market, solve problems like API keys in a matter of minutes or hours, not weeks or months, um, and also provide an amazing experience to the developers that consume the API. Because we know that engineers are craftspeople. I, as a, an engineer, I care deeply about the experience I put out into the world that developers are going to use. I want them to think it's cool. I want them to think the docs are beautiful um, 
And so that's what we're trying to do with Zupo. Uh, if you're planning or working on a new API, a new public API, and you're looking for an API management experience that's fast, made for developers, gives you full control over your API experience, head on over to Zuplo.com and try it now free. Zuplo customers are already doing more than 1.5 billion API requests per month on the Zupo platform. So you should join the revolution and come and help redefine API management for developers.